Hello and welcome everyone to this month's Research Roundup Video On Demand. My name is Chris Kuiper, Director of Research at Fidelity Digital Assets. And as always, I'm joined with Jack Newrider, uh, my research colleague here. Jack, we've got a lot of stuff to go over today. I hope you had a good holiday weekend for you and all of our viewers in the United States, the Labor Day weekend. Uh, but we've got a lot coming up on us here. So we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin and Ether, the price action, Obviously, the merge is the big story that we're covering in our newsletter and with our recent report. Uh, and then if we have time, we've got a new White House report that was just out yesterday that we've gone through and have a few thoughts on as well. All right. So first of all, Bitcoin and Ethereum price action. So uh, we're showing it a little differently this time. We're showing the one-year returns so you can see both of them together. You can see uh, back in the fall of 2021, Bitcoin was outperforming Ether, uh, Ethereum's native token there as it went to new all-time highs, close to 69,000. Uh, but more recently, we've had a little more outperformance on the Ether or Ethereum side. And so we'll get into a little bit why that is. But just in general, for both of these, macro still remains in the driver's seat. I know I've said, sound like a bit of a broken record lately, but uh, that remains to be the case. We are still in a tightening environment. We've shown charts before of both of these responding to uh, liquidity and the tightening that we've seen going on. Uh, we've got a 75 BIP raise on the table now for uh, the U.S. Fed come September meeting. And the ECB just did a 75 basis point uh, raise as well, which I believe is the, the largest single point raise they've ever done in their history. Um, so, Jack, to me, I don't see the Fed stopping at this point. I, I continue to see tightening. They've got the labor market on their side. They've got pretty good consumer spending on their side. Uh, so unless we see some kind of big liquidity event or or episodic kind of shock to the market where uh, you've got uh, the Fed needing to inject money to 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 help it out, um, I don't see them kind of changing their overall stance here. But wondering if you have any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm I'm pretty much in complete agreement there. We've seen all year essentially. You could have looked at traditional assets to to figure out basically what was going on in, in Bitcoin and and Ether and, and crypto markets more broadly, because for the most part, it's just been risk on and risk off environments and, and crypto markets have been subjected to that same uh, pain essentially all year long. Uh, and if you look at the difference between, you know, the dispersions in returns between Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, we'll, we'll show that in a few minutes uh, specifically, but I actually just checked the year to date chart. And this is this is the one year chart in front of us, but the year to date chart, they're both down 55% on the year. So identical returns from the two largest assets in crypto. And, you know, if you look at the S&P, you know, obviously down less, but, but again, risk assets have sort of been, you know, wagging the dog's tail, so to speak. Sure. And of course, the question we always get in these deep bear markets is, has the fundamental investment thesis for any of these changed? Our answer would arguably be no. And one of the fundamentals we look at uh, are things like um, active addresses. You know, we put up this chart in our, our reporter newsletter last month, noting that the on-chain fundamentals uh, were not supporting that kind of bear market rally we saw in Bitcoin for a little bit there. Uh, however, we are getting a little bit of an uptick here now. So I think holding strong. But one of the other things we've noted is if you look at uh, fundamentals and then also kind of valuation metrics, so realized price, MVRV, um, they're showing, you know, what historically has been uh, localized bottoms for Bitcoin. Now, of course, past performance is no indication of future performance. Uh, but if I could make an analogy to kind of the traditional equity world, it would be like showing a value stock, right? And so if the thesis for the stock hasn't changed and it's showing some good valuation metrics, uh, that's usually a good time uh, to consider it as an investment. However, these are not timing devices, right? A cheap stock can stay cheap for a long time. Uh, usually investors are looking for some kind of catalyst. And I think that's kind of where we're at here. You know, things are looking, quote, cheap on a number of metrics, uh, but it doesn't mean that it can't stay cheap or, or stay down for a long time, especially with macro continuing to be in the driver's seat there. Uh, the other thing I, I just noticed the other day, I don't have a chart on it, but uh, the hash rate is near all-time highs as well. And the difficulty adjustment just the other week had an over 9% jump. So a huge jump in difficulty adjustment, uh, which is something that surprised me given how low the price is. Remember, the, the lower the price for Bitcoin, the less profitable it is for miners. So to see that 9% difficulty adjustment and that hash rate going up, uh, to me, is really encouraging on the fundamental side. Yeah, I think we could start to see 
uh, mining equipment, you know, old generation mining equipment, especially with a new wave coming online uh, at the moment, start to like shift hands like we had you know, previously in the, the 2018, 2019 bear market where all the old mining equipment shifted to lower cost energy input places uh, where the marginal cost of energy was uh, effectively nothing. Uh, and we'll likely see a similar trend take place if you know if the price is down and and difficulty rises, then older mining equipment is less efficient, and therefore you need a really low cost uh, of energy in order to be you know somewhat profitable. Right, exactly. So uh, macro fundamentals. Let's turn a little more towards the the technical price action. Uh, what are you seeing here with exchange volumes, Jack? Yeah, so I pulled two charts uh, on spot trading volume, and you can see you know on this chart it goes back to 2017. You can see the 2018. 2019 period of time where you had this peak in trading volume and then trading volume fell off a cliff until we had another bull run, you know, three, four years later in, in 2021, really the start of it. Uh, and then again, you sort of see a similar trend uh, in USD, you know, trading volume, right? But if we shift over to the next slide and we pull it into native token form, right here, uh, you can see that Although trading volumes, you know, fell in USD terms dramatically, and it looks very similar to, you know, prior bear markets, it's not like everybody just left and, and took all of that liquidity away. It's really just the dollar value of Bitcoin and Ether, like the price has gone down 60%. And so in USD volume terms, the, the volume has come down because the price of the tokens come down, but the actual like trading volume on centralized exchanges, as we can see here, hasn't necessarily fallen off a cliff when you look at it in native token terms. And so it's not like everybody's gone uh, and, and we need all net new players. It's really just there's, you know, there's less less trading volume in USD terms because the price of the tokens have fallen. Yeah, that's interesting. And in our a uh, written report, we actually talk about the percentage of liquid versus illiquid. And, you know, you can define that however you like. We just said coins that haven't traded in over a year versus coins traded under a year. Uh, and we're seeing a move, uh, a bigger percentage of coins traded uh, in uh, coins not moved in over a year increase. So in other words, you know, these are coins probably going to longer term or cold storage. Uh, so this is even more surprising to me that you're still seeing a lot of trading, even though more and more exchange are kind of, or more and more uh, coins are being removed from exchanges and removed from circulation, so to speak. Yeah, and worth noting that if you look at decentralized exchange volumes relative to centralized exchange volumes, centralized exchange volumes have held up far better uh, than decentralized exchange volumes, which is just you know, interesting because decentralized exchanges, all of that capital has to be natively held on chain versus you know, centralized exchanges, uh, you have, you know, capital that can flow off chain uh, with fiat on and on ramps as well. And so it's held up relatively better. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And so next, if we shift to this is, you know, year to date price charts uh, of Bitcoin, and then we have Ether on the next slide, uh, we can see what I would call sort of a, a scary uh, tapping of resistance, basically all summer long. I mean, if you look at the chart in June, you could have just gone away you know, when, when the price of Bitcoin was at 19K in June and effectively nothing had happened over, you know, the, the course of the entire summer, you could have gone on vacation. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. You continue to see Bitcoin bounce off of this support level. And the question is, how many times can you bounce off of that support level uh, and, until it becomes, you know, flipped and becomes resistance? Uh, we, we saw, you know, a similar period of time, if you look on the chart from May to June, where you bounced off of support and then the price fell 30% because eventually that support didn't hold, right? There were too many sellers and it just couldn't take it. Um, same questions being asked here. And then if we flip to Ether, and this is going to sort of flip into the, the merge story, uh, the price of Ether year to date is down effectively the exact amount uh, that Bitcoin is down, but it's, it's taken a different path. Right. Typically, Ether trades with like a, a beta to Bitcoin, kind of. Right. Bitcoin sort of runs the market. And as the price of Bitcoin falls, the smaller market cap tokens tend to rise and fall, but even you know harder. Right. They have a higher beta to to Bitcoin or, or to risky, you know, risky asset moves. Uh, and so the price of Ether fell uh, more sharply. But we've we've actually seen a bounce since that June bottom. Uh, upwards of 50% at the time of this you know, 
speaking. And I think a lot of that has to do with the narratives uh, around Ether at this time versus versus Bitcoin's narratives, where there are narratives around this merge that's coming next week that, that we'll talk about in a minute. I don't know if you have anything else to add before we flip into the merge. Um, but for me, this is the big talking point is, why is the price of Ether bouncing since June, where the price of Bitcoin is, is still sort of stagnant in large part? Yeah, we, I don't have a slide here for it, but Bitcoin in particular has just really been uh, hammered or, or, or suppressed by the strength of the dollar, because of course, we're looking at Bitcoin in dollar terms, the dollar index DXY has been on an absolute tear. And it's done that because of weakening in, in all the major currencies of the basket, the, the Euro, the Yen, the British pound. Um, and so I think that's what's really been the driving story there for Bitcoin. Again, that that macro in the driver's seat. And uh, really what's unique about this, you know, the, the most dangerous words in finance, they always say is this time is different. So I don't want to say that here, but I will say, Bitcoin has never been through a, a true recession or bear market, right? It, it didn't even exist until early 2009. It didn't really have a price until well into 2010 and wasn't even traded until you know well into 2011. Um, so unless you count the COVID recession, which was so short and so sharp, uh, and Bitcoin sold off with everything there as well, uh, we haven't seen it gone go through a, a true recession. And, and it's unique this time in that Bonds, equities, everything except maybe commodities are all selling off. And so we wouldn't expect Bitcoin to be any different here in this environment where, uh, you know, cash and, and volatility are the only things that are providing uh, safe safe havens for people right now. Uh, but going back to, to Ether. So why is Ether moving more than Bitcoin, as you uh, alluded to here? Well, we've got the Ethereum merge. So we don't want to get too much into this because we just put out a report. We, we cover more details in our latest uh, newsletter and blog post, but uh, you can download the report on the URL below there or look at the uh, point your phone to that QR code to go directly to the download. Uh, but Jack, just real briefly, uh, what are your thoughts around the merge here and what's going on with the price of Ether? Yeah, in some ways, I look at it as Ethereum fights a battle on two fronts. Uh, not to go on a tangent, but one of those fronts is like the technology battle, and that's the network battle against alternative layer ones, primarily a defensive battle for Ethereum, right? Because Ethereum was you know, the first Turing complete smart contract layer one platform. And then after that, you had all of these different offshoots uh, and competitors. And we've seen periods of time where you know there's there's demand for Ethereum block space, and then fees get really high, and then that that basically pushes people into other ecosystems and those are competitive layer ones to me that's not what this is about it's not about scaling making transactions happen faster or cheaper uh, this is really about in a lot of ways i look at it as like this offensive battle uh against like bitcoin in, in some respects of ether the token or the asset becoming potentially more attractive to you know your your average investor um, because of some of these you know benefits that are highlighted here the reduction in energy consumption which of course comes with trade-offs the fact that ether will now be a yield bearing asset uh, and then the fact that no longer do you have to you know, subsidize miners with new ether and so you can dramatically reduce the supply issuance of ether um, and so all of those sort of concoct this like narrative that's really strong around ether especially in the short term if we're to assume you know roughly a week from now if the merge happens that it happens successfully i think the narratives are really strong around ether and then on a relative basis to bitcoin you know there isn't as many talking points where macro is a headwind for both assets and so on a relative basis i think you can create this picture where ether maybe outperforms bitcoin in the short term and again there's tons of nuance to the long term check out the report um, but in the short term i think there's a lot of a lot of talking points you know developing around ethereum yeah so those talking points pushing the outperformance gets to our next slide here, which is uh, Bitcoin versus Ethereum. A lot of people show the, the token price, uh, but we've actually shown it here as a percent of market cap, which we think is you know a little more accurate uh, to show the, the total amount because the, the supply of course can change and, and just showing the price of the token uh, is in a true relative figure here. So uh, here we've got it pushing up against those kind of previous highs of, I don't know where that's from, 55% of, of Ethereum's market cap versus Bitcoin. Um, you gave some of the, the points of, of why we might see Ethereum outperform. And of course, the, the huge one everyone is anticipating in the Ethereum camp is the quote flippening. So uh, 
does Ethereum's market cap match Bitcoin and then even exceed it? Uh, so I think in the Bitcoin camp, people would say, uh, no, I don't think that's going to happen because kind of in vain, in the, in the same vein as our Bitcoin first report that we put out, uh, Bitcoin is first and foremost a monetary good. It, it has all the properties of, of what make for a good money, and therefore people will choose to hold and store wealth in it for the long term. And so that's what is going to continue with uh, adoption and continue to increase Bitcoin's market cap. Uh, these proponents would say Ethereum, uh, it may be going to a lower inflation rate, maybe even deflationary, uh, but it doesn't have the same kind of assurances of the highest decentralization, the highest security that people would want to put their trust in it long term as that store of value. Uh, what would you say to that, Jack? Not saying you necessarily believe the opposite or anything, but could you give us some counterpoints there? Yeah, no, I think that's a great defense of, of Bitcoin, right? And it would certainly be monumental because Bitcoin has throughout its entire existence, it was the first and it has always been the largest by market cap, you know, digital asset. You can see that the time where Ethereum got its closest to flipping Bitcoin um, and then failed and has been basically in hibernation ever since. Uh, but you, but really, I would say one from a charting perspective, look at that chart and look at the resistance. And when you look at it on the, the token basis as well, it's even more clear how much it's like Ether is pushing up against this resistance point that if you break it, and I'm not like some technical analyst, you know, chartist, but like there's sort of nothing but clear skies from a charting perspective. If you, if you flip that resistance into a, a support level on the ETH BTC ratio chart. Um, but I think the longer term discussion that somebody in the Ethereum camp would make for flipping would be one, um, if we are to, to live in this world that continues to exist similar to today, like the market cap for a non-sovereign form of money has always been much smaller, uh, it's particularly recently relative to like the market cap of, of like technology companies. And if Ethereum is enabling technology to be built on top of it, then potentially the addressable market is larger than if we're going to, we're going to call it, you know, Bitcoin's addressable market just to be gold in its form today. Right now if, to not to play both sides here, but like the Bitcoin argument back would be like, well, we've lived in this system for 50 years that looks like it's going to start to change its structure. And therefore gold is, you know, suppressed in price or, you know, the, the value of non-sovereign store value assets would grow. Uh, and so therefore that's not an accurate representation of the addressable market. And then the other talking point, I think for, from Ethereum's camp uh, would be around flows. And that's where if Ethereum, you know, if you combine the upgrade from last year, which creates this burning effect of ether, uh, you can actually, you know, project forward the fact that the the total supply of ether tokens will decrease. So technically, it will become deflationary, uh, and therefore you need net sellers in order for the price of ether to go down. And so, just as long as there's enough buyers relative to sellers, then the price of ether would naturally drift drift upwards versus a proof of work network always has some sort of a demand uh, to pay for uh, the, that new issuance, you know, of tokens in, in Bitcoin's case that go to miners where some of those miners have to sell those tokens. So therefore you need net buyers uh, in order for the price to go up for Bitcoin and you need net sellers in order to keep the price down for Ethereum, I think would be like sort of a longer term case anyways. Yeah, a lot of stuff in there. We're definitely going to be continuing to watch it. And, uh, you know, same with our Bitcoin first uh, paper, you know, different use cases, uh, different markets, addressable markets, right? There's nothing to say that both of these can't continue to grow together, even though their ratios might change, right? Um, so we're getting close to time here. I did want to briefly touch on this new report. We didn't have it in our written uh, report because it just came out yesterday. So I want to touch on it here in our video, uh, but we've got the first report that has come out of the executive order back in March from the Biden administration on digital assets. If you remember, they uh, directed a lot of these different departments or agencies to release their own reports. Uh, there's actually supposed to be six released by now. This is the first one we've gotten. So we're anticipating quite a slew of a few more here. Um, but this is the first one, climate and energy implications of crypto assets in the US. Uh, I'll just briefly go through, you know, the good and in, in my opinion, our opinion is it does acknowledge a lot of the value and potential here. It actually shows a respectable level of understanding of the technology. So 
For example, I thought they went through a very nice illustration of how a transaction actually works. And they, they got pretty much right the balance between the miners and the nodes. This is an area of a lot of confusion of who actually enforces the rules and, and how the governance of the network works. Um, they are aware of you know Bitcoin being powered by renewable sources and things like stranded uh, gas. Uh, and they acknowledge trade-offs. This is the big thing we constantly hammer that you can't just uh, live in utopias of, of different things when you're talking about the engineering and the physics of this. Uh, there's there's natural and physical trade-offs with all these things. Uh, the bad, in, in my opinion, is uh, throughout the paper, they, they cite a pretty poor uh, electricity calculation. In our opinion, this is the, the debris, digi-economist kind of stuff, which is all out there. And, um, you know, we've talked before about how that is not, in our opinion, a good a good measure of how to calculate that. They have some poor comparisons of the electricity uses of Visa and MasterCard, for example. Uh, and then the big one that's gotten people riled up is this language around a potential executive or legislative action to reduce energy use. Now, to be fair, it's pretty vague. So there's there's nothing with teeth there. Um, but the fact that they're thinking about it is is maybe some cause for concern, but something we'll continue to to monitor as well. Uh, so I think that's about all we have time for today. Uh, continue to go to FidelityDigitalAssets.com, click on research to see that latest report on the merge, and we will see you next month. Thank you for watching. Great.